Good day. Okay, and welcome. The University of Lesbridge's Blackfoot name is Siniskin, meaning sacred buffalo stone. The university is located in traditional Blackfoot Confederacy territory. We honor the Blackfoot people and their traditional ways of knowing and caring for this land, as well as all Aboriginal peoples who have helped shape and continue to strengthen our university of community. It is my great pleasure today to welcome Dr. Jackie Rice to the Edgehog interviews. Dr. Jackie Rice is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, you are also the Dean of the School of Graduate Studies and Associate Vice President Research. So many important roles on campus and I'm really looking forward to talk with you today. And to, just to start, would you like to tell our audience how you came to the university and how your career developed? Thank you, Utia, and this is a real pleasure to be here. So I, I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I've been with the University of Lethbridge since 2002, and I came here directly out of my, my PhD. So I had done some teaching prior to that while I was a PhD student, but it, this, was, this was a really big step. And I feel like I've done a lot of my growing up, if you like, here at the University of Lethbridge and, and determining what kind of teacher and researcher and, and faculty member I wanted to be. A lot of that has been shaped here as, as I kind of um, built my, my network and, and, and learned things as I went along. So there was a lot of learning on the fly. I, I really feel that that was the case. Um, but having said that, the University of Lethbridge has been really great for that and there have been lots of opportunities provided for, for support and, and guidance. Would you like to share with us some of your especially like early teaching experience in the undergraduate classroom and how that has developed because that's a typical entry point and at the core of what we do at the university. Just how does this look like for you? My very first teaching experiences were at the University of Victoria, where I was teaching some quite large classes. Um, I had mentors to support me, but no formal training on teaching. And so a lot of it was learning as I went along. And then the same kind of thing happened here at the University of Lethbridge, where again, there was some guidance and mentorship, which was wonderful, but, but no real formal training on what the best practices were. So I can remember, for instance, my, my first attempt at teaching introductory programming, where the um, instructor that I was working with was quite amazed at how much material I had covered in that first <laughs> course. So, you know, I, as a new instructor, I had high aspirations and, and really good intentions, but I had a lot to learn. So those first experiences, both, but both institutions, kind of showed me that I could do things differently. But it's really only been in the last maybe five years where I've, I've been aware of, been made aware of some of the best practices and some of the things that I could do differently particularly in terms of getting student feedback and using that to guide some of how I approach my, my teaching. So I, I really do think that I, I would have benefited and so would my students if I'd had a little more of that earlier on, I think. As you said, your, your teaching has, has developed. Would you like to share maybe one of your most favorite teaching moments, what you really enjoy or what kind of strategy you think is, is really helping you? Just to kind of, you know, highlight where you're now in your teaching. That, that's a tricky one because I do try to tailor how I, how I approach the classroom depending on what both the, what the level is and what the type of material I'm teaching is. Um, and of course, at the graduate level, it, it looks quite different than at the, the entry undergraduate level. So I think my, I, I don't know if I could choose my favorite <laughs> moment, but I think what I can say is that I feel like I'm doing something right because I, I do get notes from students that say thank you, that say that they chose to continue on in this area because of because of their experiences with me, because of a course that I taught them. I always try to relate what I'm doing to real world experiences either that I've had 
or that they might have, and I think that students appreciate that. I try to give them as much preparation for that next stage in their career, whatever that might look like, um, in, in my classrooms, and I think they also appreciate that. So, you know, from a 30-seat digital logic class to an intro programming class with 90 students to a, a graduate cohort, it's, it's got to look different. And I think that's probably the biggest thing I've learned from, from that starting point to now, is, is it has to be tailored and it has to be built on what that particular cohort of students needs. Well, that's so wonderful to hear because I think that's actually in general, the culture at the University of Lesbos, right? That we are really student focused yeah. and our classrooms are small enough that we can do that, that we do know our students well and we can adjust, right? And yes. especially the last year was an example of adjustment, a steep yeah. learning curve. But I think this underlying principle to focus on the students and to tailor our teaching to the students' needs is really what I feel we, have, we do well here in general. And so yeah. this was a nice example to hear. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And, and it's nice to have that flexibility with a larger institution where you're trying to teach the same material to, let's say, 2,000 students in a cohort, there is going to be less flexibility. So just the fact that we're a bit smaller institution definitely lends it, lends it to that kind of thing. And then, as you said, that's for me also the rewarding moment, right? Because yeah. you know your students, you see how they develop, you can see them maybe in a later classroom or you meet them in graduate studies so or just on the whole way, and you see the impact that good teaching does yeah. on their careers, on their lives, and just on how they enjoy being at the university, right? And this is, for me, one of the major driving forces, I think, in teaching, right? Because you do get that feedback. Yeah. It's really hard to lecture to too many students, but as soon as there's this personal connections, we feel it's valuable what we do. <laughs> well, and you said something interesting there. I, I do think it's about those personal connections, the relationships that we can try to build, and we can't connect with every single student, but I think many instructors and professors would be surprised what their students take away in terms of that connection. Even in those large classrooms, they're making connections to us that they might not be aware of and that we might not be aware of until later on. Um, so I, I, do, I think that that's really valuable and I also think that the liberal education philosophy that the University of Lethbridge has lends itself to that as well. That importance of the different perspectives and the connections to things that we can see from a broader perspective, I, th I think all of those things are kind of connected here and, and make a difference in, in how we teach and what students take away. Yeah, it really transcends the individual classrooms. Yeah. But I wanted to come back to what you said earlier because it's so typical for university teaching that typically you, like many of us, like me, we get hired out of a PhD or postdoc in a discipline where we do research in a particular discipline. And traditionally, there's very little preparation for teaching, yet it's such an integral part of what we do every day. So in hindsight, what would you envision is the best way how we can help new people coming to the university to have a good start into teaching, to get the support they need? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, I do think that there are things we could do differently here, although the Teaching Center and folks like yourself are doing an amazing job of, of providing opportunities. But I think we, we also see that many of those opportunities are grasped by people who are already building their portfolio in that kind of area. And maybe those who don't realize they, they could benefit from it could, could use an extra incentive. So um, some kind of required opportunity for people to, to get a sense of, again, what the best practices are in teaching and, and just get started on the right foot, I think would be really helpful for many new faculty members and also for graduate students who are looking to see if this is a career choice for them or who have already made that decision. Many institutions do have a required uh, teacher training process, a set of courses that, that are required and it enables students grad students or faculty members to kind of get a sense of what's, what's out there, what they can use. It, it 
forces sometimes some practice with, with some of the techniques to find what works for them and what doesn't. And it then goes on that CV, which can make a big difference when, when you're looking for that first position. Do you have that experience and that training? And can you, can you provide evidence of it? Yeah, it's certainly a very important professional skill nowadays, yeah. right? And I think we've seen a lot of growth in that area in the University of Lesbridge over the last Absolutely. 10, 15 years. The teaching center has been instrumental in growing a community of really invested teachers and now also a mentoring program. But I think you're right, there's room for further growth to really capture yeah. the vast majority of our teachers and to offer it also to, to many of them, right? A mentoring program, for example, is something that's very, very powerful, but it depends also on having enough mentees and creating the sense that this is important, that people also get recognition for investing time into it. And it ties into, as you said, graduate student education. So I think that's a big topic we have to talk about today. But before we dive very deep, <laughs> Can you just give us an overview of what is graduate studies? So many graduate students choose to go that route because they've completed an undergraduate degree and they want to dive into some topic in more depth. So it's an opportunity for, for, for instance, research into an area with, with a lot more depth, but it's also sometimes a choice for students who, who are going professional route and they want to see what um, what other ways they can use their skills, how they can build their skills in that professional area more broadly sometimes. So it could be depth or it could be breadth. And then there's a variety of different ways that students can, can um, pursue graduate studies. It can be through performing research and usually writing a thesis, or it can be course-based. And all of those things are, are designed based on the, the needs of the student, but as well the particular program we're offering. So it's really varied. And I think the, the one thing in common across all graduate programs is, of course, students need an undergraduate degree first, but it offers that extra level of either training or explore, exploration in a particular area. And as we can hear already in how you talk about it, it's very individualized, yes. right? So the students can really explore their interests. It's much less structured than the undergrad yeah. program, which is sometimes an opportunity and a challenge, yes. I assume. And one of the key roles in guiding the students through such an individual program is the role of a graduate supervisor. Um, can you share a bit what your experience is as a graduate student supervisor? Yeah, and, and so we talked a bit about relationships and personal connections earlier, and that's really key to any graduate opportunity, even a, a course-based program. There's almost always a supervisor or, or a series of supervisors to build that personal relationship. And for me, my, my first experience was, was with a student who maybe could have been better prepared I certainly could have been better prepared and, and so we encountered a number of hurdles that probably could have been smoothed out if I had had more experience in that. So providing support for supervisors as they're working on building those relationships and providing the guidance. Uh, all, all of us experience hiccups on our pathways and, and to have somebody there who can help to guide you through navigating that can make such a difference. And if that person is also learning as they go, sometimes it's not, you know, I'll use the word again, the smoothest <laughs> experience that it could be. And that's okay, you know, learning is a good thing from everybody's perspective. But, uh, but if, we can, if we can make that experience a positive one, for everybody, then, then I think that's the goal. And, and again, some training, some support, some guidance for the supervisor would really, really help. And, and it's not always there. It certainly wasn't there f when I started out and, and I learned on the fly. So I would do that differently if I had to start again. <laughs> yes, and I, I can only echo what you said, right? The, because it's such an individual experience, also as a supervisor, we have to adapt so much to the individual, right? It's really not a standardized form of educating the, the next generation of students. And it's also much more than 
transferring knowledge. Even in undergraduate, we have yeah. much more than transferring knowledge, but especially in graduate education, supervisors have many more responsibilities. So in, in your opinion, what are all the many roles that a supervisor play? Like where does a supervisor have to help, support or challenge a graduate student? Yeah, and I was just thinking about that because often when we think about graduate studies, we think about training opportunities. And so that's one huge role that the supervisor plays in providing those training opportunities, either doing the training themselves or making sure that others in the institution are providing that training. But it goes so much further than that. It's, it's not quite like parenting, <laughs> but sometimes it is a bit like parenting where, where you have to sometimes let the student do things in a way that you might not choose if you were doing it, but this is their choice, this is their pathway, and they have to learn from that. So balancing that, that piece of, of guidance and letting them make their choices and providing hopefully a soft landing if it turns out not to be the right choice, with the training that has to take place within a certain time frame, as well as being an advocate for opportunities if anything should go wrong. Yeah, I, I mean, those are just a few of the hats that a supervisor really should be wearing, um, as, as well as helping a student to realize when maybe they need some help, with either with, again, the training and the knowledge, maybe some of the skills they need to build aren't coming as naturally as they would like, and, and approaching it in a different way might be advantageous but sometimes there's other challenges that students encounter and, and sometimes a supervisor just has to say, you need to get some help with this, whatever that might look like. And that is really hard because that's in a sense admitting as a supervisor that you can't necessarily be all of their help, that there are other th places they might need to go for that help. Um, that's not common, at least in my experience, thankfully, but it, it does happen and it can change a person's life. So I think that's really important to keep in mind. Yeah, we have a high responsibility as supervisors, right? A yeah. huge influence on the graduate student voice. And I like what you described, this balance between supporting and guiding them. But in the end, the goal is that the graduate students become independent. And ideally, especially when they leave with a PhD, they are our peers, right? So you, yeah. you have that um, honor and pleasure to witness a student to grow from being a student to being your peer. But that also means you have to be very careful between guidance and let go, right? And it's this, yes. this tension that makes it interesting, but also challenging. And yeah. every student is different again in, in, in taking this. Yeah, yeah. And, and that transition doesn't seem very big when you look at it, maybe as a, from the perspective of an, of an undergraduate student, but from the perspective of the student themselves, going from, you know, go, even going into a master's degree, They've just come out of something that's very structured. There's not a lot of choices in, in how one approaches that to something that is that can be, depending on the graduate program, very broad and very, so many choices. And at the end, we want them to have learned how to make those choices. If they go on then to a PhD, they should be developing a lot of that program, a lot of that project, whatever whatever they're going to pursue in that. And then as you say, yeah, at the other end, when they're finished that, we, we want them to be colleagues, making those independent decisions and, and able to um, choose their own route. Yeah, one, one typical example I find is interesting that illustrates that, that development of the students is that at the beginning, we have to have them write a proposal, right, or a plan for their graduate studies, where they often need quite a lot of guidance. And it's, it's about their plan, but it's also about how to justify it, how to write it, how to communicate about it. Yes. Then we see how they may communicate their research throughout graduate studies at conferences, for example. And we have some in-house too, right, where they have to mm -hmm. talk to the public. And in the end, they have to write this thesis, and it's, again, a very different form of communication and I think that's often a key element too of not just teaching the subject but guiding them in communicating this and becoming independent in communicating it which can cause challenges right it's not yes. easy it's often a skill that the students have 
not mastered yet when they enter, especially if they are in, in the programs that are not writing heavy in the undergrad yet. Yeah. It's, that communication skill is, is huge. There's a number of skills, I think, that graduate students don't realize they will need or that they're developing throughout their programs. Um, communications to various audience and in various ways and the appropriate style is, is one of them. But the people management, the conflict resolution, the working individually, the working in the team, all of those pieces are part of a graduate program and, and lots of students and sometimes supervisors aren't clear on that. We, we all come out of it having learned those skills one way or another, but, but sometimes it's not explicit. And, and I do think that it could be made explicit. And some of what we're working on in the School of Graduate Studies, we are building some professional development opportunities for, for students that, that will make the skills more evident and also help students to develop them in different directions. But Regardless, it's part of any graduate program, and, and yeah, sometimes that's not clear to all of us. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think it's a very important newer trend. In the past, especially if you go back several decades, it was very heavily discipline-specific research yeah. focus, and now we understand that the graduate students need to come out with these professional skills. So can you maybe give some uh, examples how the School of Graduate Studies helps the students and maybe the supervisors to more explicitly get specific skills? Like what are the kind of programs that you're offering? Well, one perfect example is, is the writing boot camp that is available and that's to help students in a number of ways. I mean, it's called writing boot camp and of course, so it's a bit about writing, a lot about writing, but it's also about how to get there from kind of here's your goal how do I start? How do I build that piece of whatever it is that I'm trying to write? And then how do I wrap it up, right? So it's, it's time management, it's project management, because some of these writing projects can be very large, and, and a number of different things that is very individual to each student, but is, is an essential skill. You have to have all those pieces, otherwise you're gonna find it really difficult to succeed in a graduate program. So the writing boot camp is one, um, and there are other opportunities that we're building, for instance, with external uh, groups like MyTax about um, networking, speaking to different audiences, um, entrepreneurship, the list goes on and on, right? So, so all of these things that could be helpful to a student, depending on what career choice they choose after a graduate program, is what we're, we're trying to build and, and offer to our students. Yeah, and I'd like to follow up on this, right? Because I think it, it illustrates that we have to also think about what is the career that graduate students pursue once they have their degree from the University of Lesbos. Yeah. So what do you see there? What are the examples? What is what is really sort of the purpose almost of graduate studies? The underlying purpose, I would say, is, is really to, to have students think in different ways. Because again, graduate programs are so varied. So if I had to pick one common theme across all of them, it's, it's training students to think about things more deeply, more um, critically and, and really get that perspective that they might not have thought of in, in their undergraduate degree. So that, that would be across the breadth of all our graduate programs. Specifically, it, it really depends, right? So I'm a computer scientist, so my students are coming out of a graduate program, I hope, ready to consider a, a, a career in academia, maybe but also ready to teach other students or to work in industry developing software or to provide consultant services to folks like, for instance, the university yeah. where we need to build new software, right? So, so there's a huge variety of things that my students could be doing and I'm not necessarily training them in any one of those. I'm training them how to learn and how to fit into any of those opportunities. And, and so I try, although you know, I look at one particular area, I try to make sure we have conversations as a group about what these other things could look like and what they should be bringing with them to any of those roles. And I think every supervisor does this in a certain way because you never know where your student's gonna end up. 
So having those discussions, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or as a group about what's gonna be important to you as a graduate student in that next phase of your life. What, what do you need to know about yourself and, and what, what you're gonna take to that role? Um, what opportunities should you be looking at to see if that's a good fit for you? And, and how do you find those opportunities? So there's some networking there. And for me, one of the things I've really tried to start emphasizing in, in my discussions is ethics, because in computer science, we don't always think about the ethical ramifications of what we're doing, because it's not always obvious. Facial recognition is a perfect example. If you're, if you're training a computer to recognize faces, you don't necessarily think about what the ethics of different facial characteristics are. You might think about the ethics of privacy and those kinds of things. That's more obvious. But what about the ethics of how a system is trained to do a particular task? Is it going to be different, for instance, for a white person than a person of color? And students in a graduate program aren't always thinking about those things because they get really deep into their project and they get kind of immersed in the in the details and the weeds and the you know all of the nuances but not necessarily the big picture so that's what I'm trying to do with my students is take them back to that big picture about what their work will mean once they're out there contributing in a different way potentially to society so I think that's really important yeah, I like what you said, that we are preparing them to contribute to society in an yeah. ever-changing society, right? I think yeah. we've seen that in the last years. The, the world is constantly changing, and so we need to teach the students, as you said, to think and to have the skills to adapt to a future that is unknown. Yeah. And that we know nothing about it, maybe not, but we can help them to be ready for whatever, almost, yes. right? Yeah. And I think um, I wanted to pick up, you, you talked about ethics. It's such an important part in what we do to think about implications of our actions. Um, so ethics of the applica applications of our research is one, um, but what about ethics in terms of, of human interactions, teamwork, um, those kind of skills, how do you see that apply in, in research, uh, sorry, in graduate studies? <laughs> yeah, well, and, and in, in research as well as other types of programs, that's, that's huge because those personal connections often bring those ethical considerations to them. Um, you know, are we treating people fairly? Are we navigating those potential conflicts when they arise in appropriate ways? What do those techniques and, and approaches for managing these kinds of things look like? How white might we have managed it 10 or 20 years ago? And what should we be doing now? What do we know now that might shape how we interact? And so I, I think that's really, really key as well, that modeling that I do as a supervisor as to what is appropriate, what is ethical, what I should be doing to improve my knowledge of society, um, to help um, to help people resolve any concerns they might have, but as well to encourage my group of students to be working on those skills themselves because those people skills are so important and, and how you go approach it, right? Um, and, and you watch television shows all the time and you see a huge variety of, of approaches to life. And, and I think sometimes we forget that those aren't always real. And so having real people model those really important skills and offer other training opportunities as well. There's some great opportunities, which also are part of professional development, around crucial conversations, around um, awareness of other people's concerns, around possibly racism or mental disabilities, or the other things that we know we're going to encounter, all of us will, either personally or in a colleague, and how can we um, be a part of a solution rather than a part of a continuing problem? So yeah, I think that's, that's equally important. 
And again, I don't, I'm not sure, well, I'm sure the grad students don't realize that this is part of their training. I certainly didn't as a grad student, but I saw it, I saw it take place. And I, I, I fall back on some of what I saw my supervisors do. I also sometimes critically think about what they, you know, how they approach things and, and might choose a different direction sometimes. I mean, I had great supervisors. I can't <laughs> complain about anything they did. But, but still, it's, it's given me a, a new perspective to, to think critically about all of the things I've learned as a grad student and beyond. And I hope my grad students will come out with some of that critical thinking as well. Yeah, and I think this area of ethics training and communication training, which almost go hand in hand, is something we're becoming more conscious about, that we have to do it explicitly. And I think the role of a supervisor as a role model is important, yeah. but maybe we, we ought to go a little bit beyond even and make it explicit and not just implied in our actions, but really actively prepare the students. Um, have you seen any promising approaches of how we can do better in that important area? I think that it requires a blend of approaches. I think that the role of the supervisor in offering the informal kinds of guidance and mentorship is, is you can't overstate that importance. But I also think that, as you said, some formal training as part of courses is important and should, should be a part of any programs as we, we develop them. Um, and, and as we review our existing programs, I think we need to do more of that. I think that we can offer professional development opportunities around these kinds of activities. So, so I really do think that, that it's a blend. And, and maybe where the School of Graduate Studies can, can do things a little differently is make it part of our, our orientation, our onboarding, to say, you know, this is important. You're going to learn more about this. Here's a little piece that may be helpful to you. But to set that stage for the, the starting piece for graduate students um, as, as they begin their career, but also do that for supervisors right, to set the stage with them as well. When they become supervisors, say to them, okay, we've got some modules for you that will help to guide you in this journey you're gonna take with these graduate students and every journey is gonna be different, but here's, here's what might be important. Here's some ways to approach it. Um, and I've just been part of a conversation with, with other deans of graduate studies, and, and this is on everybody's mind. One group is developing some, some videos where difficult situations are modeled. And it's kind of like choose your own adventure because you can say, okay, well, here's one way this could be resolved. And you can see if, if, if a student or a supervisor makes a particular choice, this is kind of how things may end up. But if they make a different choice and approach things a little differently, it could end up this way. And so it's a really lovely set of videos that are being developed, which I think could be very helpful for both supervisors and graduate students to, to, to use as part of the, their, their training, if you like, in, in this area, right? Um, I previewed a couple of them and really eye-opening. It made me think, oh, am I doing that? <laughs> um, so, so I think that's what we need to be doing, is think. Am I doing that? Is this how I want to respond? And what are my options for how I might respond? And, and until you've had a little bit of training, you might not be able to do that. Yeah, and it ties it back into what we talked before, right? How important that professional development piece is, not just for the graduate student, but also for us as graduate supervisors. Yeah. Same as we talked about undergraduate teaching, but it's very different. So I think it's two different pieces of professional yes. development. But as graduate studies is getting more complex, more demanding, as we realize that there are many different skills to teach, I think this is becoming ever more important. And also, I like, I like working with case studies because it gives you this feeling of, of reality and of different options, right? Yeah. And I think as graduate supervisors, we need to know also of different options how to approach a situation because we deal individually with different students. As, yeah. as you said earlier, it's very individualized. So one approach that might work for student A, it doesn't work for student B. And yeah. I've certainly had that, that I thought, oh, now I have experience in grad studies and there comes a new student and I'm like, now I, I need to find a new approach, right? Yes. 
Um, so what is the future in professional development in graduate studies? What do you think? Well, that's, that's something we're really just starting to evolve. It's really, I think, an important part of, of what we can offer to graduate students. And, and we've, we've, of course, had opportunities, but I, I do think it can be a little bit more intentional with these kinds of conversations guiding what the opportunities look like. I think that it's really nice to have something on, on a CV, so the opportunity for courses to result in a certificate, for instance, is really helpful. And, and I'd like to see things go that direction. We've just begun kind of the, the journey, if you like, for, for developing these pieces more intentionally because we've just hired a professional development coordinator who is, who is going to be working on these kinds of things and, and building an advisory board because we know we need to hear from students, we know we need to hear from supervisors. We, we also want to hear from employers. What are they looking for in graduate students when, when they hire them? What's going to make them stand out? Because we want to do that for our students too, is, is give them that little piece above all the other graduate students from those other institutions and, and you know, make it so employers say, yeah, I want that University of Lethbridge student because I know they'll have had the training in this and this as well as their amazing graduate program that they've completed. So that's, that's kind of what I would like to see for, for professional development is, is all of these pieces from the personal to the employer to you know, that journey in between being, being addressed in one way or another. Yeah, I, I really like that. And I think that this illustrates how on the one hand, the graduate student experience for the students is always an individual one, which is important. Yeah. It's the power of graduate students. Yes. But it doesn't mean it's a lonely one. It means bringing the right people together, the groups you described, to, to create this environment where the individuals can find their way and strive. What it means, though, for the graduate students is that they have more and more check balance, right? They yes. have to do their research, they have to dive deep into their discipline, which is traditionally the focus of graduate studies, but now they also want to and have to, in a way, embrace these other opportunities for professional skills development. And another piece we haven't talked about that's coming up more and more in graduate studies is experiential learning to mm -hmm. apply their skills, to get ready for jobs. But yeah. now there is a lot to balance. How can we approach that balancing act to support our students and not to overwhelm them with ever increasing lists of demands. And you should also do these other 10 things, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. And, and in a way this, I think, reflects life. Life feels like it's more complex for, for everybody with, with all of these competing demands. And I don't know if we can blame it on social media <laughs> or, or what, but Everything is connected, and so I, I do feel there's more complexity that, that everybody has to cope with, and so particularly our graduate students, I think, need to be ready for that. But we're, I'm not in, in, the, in, the, in the area of training somebody to burn themselves out. I don't want to do that. I don't want to set that example. I don't want students to think that that's required. I want to create a learning environment for any student with, with the qualifications to be able to succeed in. And I'm thinking of my own group, they come with varying different backgrounds and varying different strengths and weaknesses, and I want them to be able to succeed at their program, which as you've said is very individualized, and, and not come out the other end feeling like they, they could never do this as a, as a career because it's so overwhelming. And I think that some graduate programs feel like that. So I do think that we have to look at graduate training and graduate programs very carefully and say, okay, how is this going to work for our students? Where we, we're recognizing we want some of this experiential learning as part of their whole program. We want them to get that depth of knowledge in whatever their chosen area is. And that takes a lot of time and dedication. And then professional development, and then taking care of oneself. And many students have families or other commitments that, that are going to take their time. And, and balancing all that is really important. 
I think as supervisors and as an administrator, we're, we're going to have to look at designing our graduate programs differently and, and building in these opportunities as part of the, the program rather than as an add-on. I think that that may mean some programs look very different. Some programs could be longer to accommodate for that. Um, that means financial burden, of course, so that would have to be accommodated. But as well, I think that we're valuing different, th I think that we need to value things differently. So I think that we need to be able to say when a student comes out of a program that that experience doing something for industry or other experiential learning piece is as valuable as maybe writing a paper. And this is going to be different for each program and each discipline, right? I can't speak for every discipline because I'm not an expert in all of them. But, but I do think that we need to be valuing things a little bit differently and recognizing that the experience working a little bit outside your main research project might make you look at that research project differently and come up with results or even better yet questions that you wouldn't have come up with if you hadn't had that piece, that different experience, right? And I know as for, particularly in PhDs where we, we train our students to be very focused and go down this very narrow path. But that's also not what life is about, right? Life is more and more about saying, oh, well, this connects over here and this connects over here and that's going to make this a more broad project that might be able to answer more questions or at least answer the questions differently, right? And so that ties back to the complexity of life, which I, I think we need to build into our programs and, and teach our students how to manage it and teach our supervisors how to value it and teach society why, why all of these pieces are important and why we need students who are trained to pull them all together um, to go out there and make a difference in the world. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the key is, is finding the synergies and integrating it, yeah. right? So that it's not add-on, but integrated it makes it also more real life, but it means we have to rethink our values. We have to rethink what has to be the outcome of graduate studies. And to tie it back into the professional skills that we talked earlier, I think one other set of skills that we need to teach the students because life is complex and graduate studies is complex is not just time management, but also maybe something like self-awareness, yes. self-management, and some skills in, in work-life balance and self-care and in protecting yourself and making yourself ready for challenges. Because we yeah. can't always expect to that students or people or us even can always do more. But we can empower the students to have the skills to know how to cope complex, challenging yeah. programs. And I think that also has to be embedded, right? Absolutely. We talk quite a bit about the challenge of, of mental health in undergraduates and graduates, and I think this is part of it, but in graduate studies there's a way to address it by integrating it. Yeah. I feel like this fits into a, a generational thing as well, right? I feel like I'm of a generation where I wanted to do a graduate degree, have a career, have a family, do all those things, which is more complex than maybe people 30 years earlier, who most of the people in academia would do one or the other. And if they did have a family, then they had somebody at home to help take care of that piece, right? So, so life and their, their approach to, to their career was simpler. And as, as we look at things differently, we, we're, we're valuing that experience that, let's say, having a family or caring for an elderly parent or whatever that might be. We're valuing that experience. So we want those people to be in graduate programs. So we have to build that in. We have to allow for that evolution, if you like, of our values and, and not expect people to be able to do everything um, as, we, as we kind of evolve who, who we want to be a part of the university and a part of leaders in our society. Yes, and I mean, 
I, I think it's important that what we do is guided by values, right? And that yes. helps us also to focus, to sometimes say no to something because we know our priorities. It's not like, you know, one thing is bad, the other is good, but sometimes you, you ought to choose and, and values are good guidance that we can give the students. And as you described, and we talked about the entire last um, half hour, the graduate student program is so individualized. So I think one of the key values that we are indirectly and maybe more explicitly should really embrace is this diversity that we have yes. in the grad student of population, in their approaches to graduate studies and, and in their outcome. And of course, diversity being tied into equity and, and inclusion, right? And allowing people to be different as you alluded to, for example, one of their family, but there are many other situations. So how do you see us really enhancing equity, diversity, and inclusion in graduate studies? That's, that's a difficult question for me, both e easy and difficult. Easy in the sense of being a woman in the field I am in, I'm often one of very few women around the table, although that's changing <laughs> lately, um, which, which is lovely, and, and, and I'm, I'm glad to see that. But that, that is something I have personally worked for, for for many, many years, pretty much since I started my career, was to try and encourage more women in computer science and engineering fields and, and support those women who were there and role model and, and all of those kinds of things that I think are really important. And in other ways, I, I try to ensure that my research groups have a variety of diverse voices from diverse backgrounds, um, gender diversity. Uh, I, try, I try to include as many different types of people as I can because I think that's really important both for, for them to interact with each other but also in terms of giving people opportunities, right? It should be a wide variety of people who are given opportunities. So that's the easy way to answer it. And then the hard thing is is for me to say, well, I think everybody should be doing that. I, I, I think that every supervisor should be looking at their research groups and saying, well, you know, I, I do think that we have some really great people with strengths and perspectives from this area. I'd like to build on this area, so diversity of skills, diversity of, again, background or gender or whatever, whatever happens to be um, maybe not represented at that particular moment. And that's going to be an individual choice for each supervisor, but I do think that that's a duty, if you like, that supervisors have because I have a lot of say in who joins my group. I mean, it's, it's, it's very personalized. And I do think that that's something that should be at the, the forefront of every supervisor's mind. And then for other programs where supervisors have a, a little bit of a different role. I think th whatever the committee is that's, that's making those decisions about admissions should be actively considering the principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And we've got a lot more learning to do. And, and I think that's good. You know, we're, we're at the starting point. We recognize that we need to learn. And then we'll need to act, right? And that's you know, the first few steps on our journey along, along that pathway. But I, I also feel that this is going to make us so much stronger in the long run, right? It's going to be a benefit to the institution. It's going to be a benefit to the individual research groups. It, it brings people to, to our community, to Lethbridge, that, that bring different things and, and can strengthen the community. So I think this is the right thing to do from so many reasons, right? It's, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited to have so many people talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion and how we can go about things differently. Yeah, I think with graduate studies, we really have an opportunity, right? Because yes. it is so, so rich in individual approaches. I, I see that we have students from many different grounds, different nationalities. Um, by now, I feel in many areas, a yes. strong group of women, right? So it's, it's coming. But this individual approach has also the flip side where it can very quickly get a bit dangerous because there's so many individual choices and I think we need to do more to educate ourselves in the 
unconscious biases that are inherent in these processes. We yeah. know there are unconscious biases in writing reference letters, for example, which is one of the keys, key evaluative steps in being admitted into graduate studies. But I, I agree with you, I think it's a learning curve of knowing what the problems are to then actively address them to further build this pool that is diverse, but also where the graduate students feel welcome, right? Because yes. that's again how we promote teamwork interactions among the graduate students, because it's, they get thrown together. They don't have choice, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> and they need to get along. Yeah. So that's another aspect I feel we need to also prepare our students that they are understand these issues better because they will be the next generation of citizens, yes. right? They have to further promote it because in the end it strengthens us. I mean, it brings so much more experience and knowledge and approaches to the table. Yeah. The interesting thing I find is that many of the students I supervise do come from other countries. And um, so they have that diversity of culture. And so we'll sometimes talk about things that are in the news in Canada. And there's, there's such a different perspective that they bring to, to these topics. And things that feel really big to us, they, they look at it and say, well, you know, that's, that's obvious. <laughs> of course you should do this. Or of course you shouldn't do this, right? And, and so that for me, I, I'm doing as much learning as they are when we have these discussions. And, and that's, that to me is what it's all about, is that openness, that they feel safe, that they can share that difference, that I'm, you know, and all the other students are open to learning. And, and hopefully, you know, if, if we identify something that we're doing that is creating barriers and making somebody feel like they're not included or not welcomed, we, we can change that. Um, but but it's a process. There's there's lots of steps to take, and and I'm doing it informally, and I I think that some formal training around this is going to be important. I think we're going to need to take that step as an institution, and provide that for particularly our supervisors. As you said, there's unconscious bias in what's a very personal decision about taking on a graduate student, but also for for the students themselves to be able to say, well, you know, I I. I feel that there's something we could do differently and to feel safe enough to share that so again we can learn and then we can act. Yeah and for me I see that both in my own graduate studies and in my group here and I think you share that too it is enriching for everybody right to experience yeah. this and the for me one of the benefits of graduate studies is you have a common goal right if you're in the same program you're interested in this topic no matter your background and i think that's the way to connect people because as moment you have one thing in common you can accept the differences and learn and benefit from the differences because there's a connection yes right and i think that's again what we talked earlier about this personal connection the community building and this this balance between the individual program, but it being embedded in the community. I think that's where we can actually set a prime example for the benefits of diversity, right? And, and also have a living example for the students of, you know, why we value this. Yeah, I think that's really important for, for students to see the, the you know, the, the value of these kinds of things, to see somebody in these roles who is actively living it and speaking it um, and, and doing things, I, I, I really, really think that's important because without seeing that, it's often hard for, for our students to be able to feel included, for them to be able to um, see how they might then involve you know be more active in in creating diversity once they are in that next stage of their career and i think it's really important particularly as we we talk about involving more indigenous students and indigenous community members in academia in in a variety of ways there's a lot of learning that we need to do there and it's going to be difficult to take our structures and how we do things and, and adapt them to make space for, for, for another culture, for this particular other culture that, that um, is, is very, very underrepresented at all levels of 
of um, academia, you know, from undergraduates to graduate students to, to faculty members. So I think that's our next big challenge. In, in amongst all of the pieces that are so important around equity, diversity, and inclusion, I think involving Indigenous students and making sure that what they can bring is celebrated and valued and any possible barriers are removed and, and, and really working hard on that particular piece. And as we started today with the welcome and the acknowledgement yes. that we are situated on Aboriginal lands and surrounded by Indigenous peoples, I think doing this more actively, more consciously in the future will also benefit our students because they also need to learn how to embrace the indigenous culture and include it, yes. right? So it goes both ways, actually. I feel the entire graduate student population will benefit, but we'll have to be carefully listening yes. and being very willing to take new approaches, being flexible, and maybe, maybe rethink our values. <laughs> and remembering that individual journey for everybody, right? Everybody's going to bring something different. Um, regardless of, of what culture they come from and, and making the space for those differences, I think is key. Yes, yeah, so last year, our university was faced with campus closure, the pandemic, all the constraints. How has that affected graduate studies and what are we learning from that for the future of graduate studies? It was a challenging year. <laughs> it was a very challenging year. What I think we saw here at the University of Lethbridge though, and this, this is going to differ for everybody, but I feel that people were less impacted than they thought they were, than they thought they would be, rather. Students have been able to continue with their programs. We've been able to be flexible about the different kinds of opportunities. And where it was really important, we were able to continue some in-person opportunities in a safe way. And I think that's, that's key as we go back to face-to-face -to -face is, is keeping in mind everything. We, we have to keep in mind people's safety. But what we learned was, was how flexible we could be, right? And, and how we could do things differently and it wasn't the end of the world, right? It's very easy for us to say, well, we've never done it that way. How could we possibly? Well, guess what? We did do it that way. And it wasn't perfect in every situation, but there were some opportunities that were created because of having to go on Zoom for everything or create different opportunities for students. So I, I do think that there are many people involved in graduate studies from administration to supervision and, and students themselves who are going to be looking for different ways to pursue a graduate degree because of what we've learned and, and to create that flexibility. And I don't think we're ready yet to fully embrace it because we're too excited to be face to face <laughs> again, right? And this is what all that anybody can talk about. But I think once, you know, once we're settled in, we'll be able to say, yeah, you know, we did do this very effectively with part of our course remote or all of our course remote or this other particular flexible opportunity. We can build that in. We can create that flexibility for our students. It may be one way of removing some of those barriers that I talked about and, and provide a few more opportunities. So I am excited. I, I do think we, we just, we're not quite there, but we're getting there. And, and I'm really excited to see faculty members embracing some, some of the flexibility around supporting their students, whether it's in a course or through supervision. Um, you know, it's, it's nothing now to start up a Zoom call and talk to somebody who's halfway around the world. A little tricky to manage the time zone difference, but you know what? We can do that and we can have that conversation face to face and that we have a comfort level with that that we never would have had without, without the pandemic. So, you know, there are some good things that have come out of that and, and it, we need to embrace them. Thank you, Jackie. What a wonderful statement to show the power of graduate studies and the flexibility of its approach. I appreciate your time today, and I, I hope we'll embrace the future together. Thank you. We certainly will, and, and thank you for this opportunity. I've really enjoyed this today. Thank you.